All right, guys, in the Foundations of American Democracy Unit, we have three basic questions that we're going to address. The first one is, what caused the American Revolution? Now, there was no singular cause. There were a lot of different factors, and we can't discuss all of them, but we're going to focus in on some of the key things that caused the American Revolution to start and to progress through. Second question is, what ideas about government are contained in the Declaration of Independence? We're not going to examine all the different aspects of the Declaration, but we are going to focus in on one key passage that discusses about four or five of the main ideas about government we discussed in the first unit that are clearly evident in Jefferson's draft. And then finally, we'll discuss the Articles of Confederation, particularly what were they and how were they flawed. Uh, basically, they were so flawed we decided to scrap them entirely and uh, rewrite a new constitution in 1787. All right, let's get to it. Okay, some of the origins of, of the American colonies started where English settlers were part of trading companies. Uh, they were granted charters by the king, and their sole purpose at the beginning particularly was to find gold, silver, and a waterway to Asia. So they weren't necessarily setting up to try to create a new country. Uh, they weren't setting up to create these vibrant civilizations. They were out to get profits. They were trying to get uh, raw materials or trying to find new trade routes. And long story short, this was disastrous. That uh, picture to the lower uh, right there, that's about uh, Roanoke Island. Okay, and Roanoke was a disastrous uh, early colony that, that fell apart, it collapsed. So a lot of these early colonies, particularly in North America, uh, did not prove um, uh, good for, for profits or for their survival. Correct, and I think as we'll also see, <clears throat> coming to a brand new area uh, meant that these colonists had to develop uh, some form of government in order to make some sense of being in a brand new place. Uh, so we'll check that out in a second. All right, the colonies began to develop their own governments. Uh, for example, in Virginia, the House of Burgesses uh, established a representative local government. And in Plymouth Colony, uh, up in Massachusetts, colonists signed a compact agreeing to form a majority rules government. So the point being is that even early on, uh, even though we were still British colonies, uh, there was this idea of uh, self-government here uh, in the New World. And this also signaled the transition from just seeking profits and trying to get you know, access to waterways and trying to find gold to actually setting up established governments, established societies, and ways for them to rule themselves. Now, despite these local governments, the king still had control over the colonies. They were not independent uh, sovereign states at all. They were still part of England. Um, and there were a few other different countries that were jockeying for position here, like the Netherlands, Spain, France. But all of what we know as the original 13 colonies, they were still governed by our overarching government of Great Britain. Uh, but by the mid-1700s, these 13 colonies did start to establish stronger governments. They got increasingly less oversight from Great Britain and start to think of themselves more as members of their colony as opposed to members of Great Britain. Taking a look at some of the relationships uh, between Great Britain and the colonies, uh, to go back to this idea of trade, uh, just important to know that even though um, you know, we still had ties with the British regarding trade, some of that trade, as you can see in the lower right-hand corner, um, we made, uh, we would sell the raw pro uh, sell the raw materials to England. England would finalize that in into products, and then also sell some of that uh, to areas of Africa or South America. Yeah, so Great Britain did rely on the colonies for the raw materials, but also to sell the finished products back, okay? So it was a two-way relationship there. And then we're not going to go into it too much, but this triangular trade, it wasn't just back and forth between England. Uh, there was also the slave trade involved. There were sugar and rum trades going from the Caribbean up north but over to Britain. So it was a very complicated system. Uh, but for our purposes here, just know that England and the colonies did have a very close relationship regarding trade, which lasted even after the revolution. Okay, Britain amassed a massive debt fighting wars during the 1700s, and some of those wars actually took place defending the colonists on the American frontier. And to help pay off a lot of this debt, they decided that we're going to start raising revenue, and that's just another way of saying we're going to tax people. And one of the first things they did was they passed the Stamp Act. And what the Stamp Act did is they taxed certain colonial documents, which hadn't been taxed in the past, and siphoned those uh, tax revenues back to Britain to help pay off some of their debts. Uh, debts. And the colonists, as you could expect, were not happy. They boycotted British go uh, goods. And a lot of the papers, you can see in that image there, that was a political cartoon or 
or an image uh, published in the paper saying you know, how terrible the Stamp Act was and how it was going to be the death of journalism as they knew it because it was going to tax that industry to death, and that people were just going to stop buying those products. Some other things that we see, acts passed by Parliament and enforced upon the American colonists, the Declaratory Act and the Quartering Acts. Just important to know here is that what we start to see is a gradual, um, a gradual amount of control and a gradual uh, amount of pressure placed on the colonies to do certain things, whether it's tax laws, uh, whether it could be quartering soldiers in homes. Um, we see things start to rise and the tensions start to build. More acts, more pressure on the colonists to do certain things. And uh, you know, it's only natural that the more that someone gets pressure to do something, uh, eventually it's gonna reach a breaking point. Now, so the Declaratory Act says that no laws passed in the colonies had effect. Now, did that actually happen? Did, did none of the colonial governments have laws anymore? No. And, you know, we need to understand that a law is only good if it can be enforced. So even though the British government was passing some of these things, uh, unless they could enforce it, it really did not have much of an effect. Okay, another one of these acts was the Townsend Revenue Act. And what that does, that tax things like uh, paint, glass, paper, tea, Basically, anything that the colonists couldn't create on their own, uh, they taxed all those British uh, goods. It also gave officials the ability to search and seize things in people's houses without a warrant. So if they thought that a colonist was not paying their fair share in taxes or they were smuggling goods into the country without paying those taxes, uh, then they would go in and take the, the items from their home. But they didn't do it with any legal... Um, methods, they would just kind of barge into somebody's house and say, all right, do you have anything? And then if they didn't find anything, they say, okay, you're all set. Yep. Um, but we're going to come back to this later in the year when we talk about the different amendments and the Bill of Rights and how we made it so that you can't do that anymore. But all these acts together, the Quartering Act, the Townsend Revenue Act, these were all called the Intolerable Acts. And that was coined by the American colonists. And in that political cartoon to the right, that's actually a depiction of um, you know, Great Britain and the officials forcing their way or forcing their um, tea taxes or all these other things onto the, the colonists and they were basically at the mercy of these British uh, parliamentarians and, and officials. Of course this brings us <clears throat> to uh, the Declaration of Independence July 4, 1776 where all of these events build up to um, not only the American Revolutionary War but um, in 76 we say okay um, that's officially uh, break away from the British as a result of all the things that you just heard about. Yeah, so the war had already been going on for about a year Correct. at that point, right? So they were already fighting back. About a third, I would say a third of the American colonists were considered patriots at this point. A yeah. third were loyalists and a third weren't really sure. But by signing this Declaration of Independence, it basically made it so that anybody who signed that, if they did not win the revolution, they were dead. Correct. I mean, there's no way they would have survived. They would have been hung for treason. So this was the point of no return for the colonies. They banded together with all 13 and decided to break away from Great Britain. In this next section, we're going to be talking about some of the basic ideas about government found within the Declaration of Independence. And that first famous line uh, that most people... Uh, equate with the declaration is, you know, we hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal. So going back to our first unit of the year, this idea on human equality, uh, equality under the law. Uh, yeah, so I have a question yeah. about that. Does that mean that all people are the same? No, uh, it, it does not have anything to do with in terms of we, we all have the same housing, uh, the same type of job, the same income, uh, not at all. But it does mean that the way that the law uh, applies uh, to everyone throughout the country uh, is the idea that we're all equal in the, in the eyes of the law, which is uh, something that uh, is definitely a, an important principle of American democracy. Okay, good. So it's not equality as in everybody is the same. It's equality as in everybody has the same uh, rights and responsibilities according to the Constitution and according to law. Correct. Okay. Okay, the next part of that section is uh, also part of uh, the natural rights theory that we discussed earlier in the year. And that is they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. This is almost word for word from Locke with his natural rights theory of life, liberty, and property. Uh, the only change there is that he changed uh, property to pursuit of happiness. Uh, but what he means by this is that uh, no matter what government system they set up, whether it be a democracy, dictatorship, the whatever it is, 
these are constant, that these rights cannot be taken away. Um, however, one of the problems with it is that it's kind of vague, right? It's like, what, what would constitute life, liberty, and property? So uh, could you help clarify, like, what does that actually mean? Right. Well, I think the line uh, life, you know, we all we all have the right to uh, be alive and, and not live in uh, a place where, you know, people are just being uh, either executed or certainly attacked by uh, their, their own government officials, things like that, which does happen in some places around the world. Liberty, freedom uh, through our various constitutional rights and um, the things that we have here. And I think the one that is the most open to interpretation is pursuit of happiness. You know, how do you want to define happiness? A lot of people have different definitions of that, but I think it means that whatever you believe happiness to be, uh, you should have a right to pursue that um, to the best extent possible. And I think so. some people, if they took an economic perspective on that, that would be more in line with like a free or an open market system. Um, where you didn't have as much government controls that you had the right yep. to pursue or own property to um, to acquire property through your talents and abilities. So um, it could also be taken in that direction, depending on your, your point of view. Also a good movie uh, with Will Smith, yeah. Pursuit of Happiness. <laughs> that is. Which actually follows a lot of the principles in here, if you watch it. I like the basketball scene. I may insert that. <laughs> anyway. All right, that to secure these rights, governments are instituted among men. Uh, I think it's important. In the beginning of the year, we looked at different forms of government. It could be a monarchy. Uh, it could be uh, a dictatorship. But in this idea, of, uh, principle of our country is that we, uh, the people, are the ones that create the government. Uh, the people are the ones um, that come together and decide what is best for the country as a whole. So this idea that uh, men uh, people coming together to create their government is really unique, uh, especially at the time that our Declaration of, In uh, Declaration of Independence was written. Yeah, because democracies hadn't been tried on a large scale since ancient Greece and Rome. Correct. Okay, so this was a at the time a radical idea that people hadn't tried in, in millennia. Okay, the next part of that that same phrase, actually, that same uh, passage, is deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. What that means is that a government uh, doesn't just have ultimate power to create laws and to administer them on its own. The power comes from the people themselves. So similar to what we talked about with a democracy, that you need consent of the governed. And that also goes into social contract theory, that people give up certain rights to the government in exchange for the government protecting their natural rights, providing services, keeping them secure. If any one of them violates those rights, like if the government violates your ability, we'll get to that in a second, then you have the right to revolt. But this part has to do with consent of the governed in a democracy. That consent is given how? Like how do we give our consent to the government? Well, last Tuesday we had our midterm elections here in the country and voting is one way that we can peacefully give consent uh, to whether we like the way things are being run or we don't. We like this person for office or we want to choose someone else. So, you know, we exercise our consent through voting. And the last form is uh, really this right to revolution or the right to revolt. So. Uh, if the government doesn't live up to protecting our natural rights, if the government no longer allows us to provide consent, um, then according to the declaration, we have a right to alter or to abolish it. Now, obviously in the way we did this with the British was uh, through a revolutionary war, so, so actual physical violent means uh, through warfare in order to change that. But you know, this, we can also alter our government through a constitutional amendment. Uh, we can alter it through various uh, ballot initiatives, as some states have done uh, through last week's election. So it doesn't always mean, uh, when you hear revolt, it doesn't always have to be a violent way, but it can be done through peaceful means as well. Did you catch that? If not, go back 10 seconds. So Adams, uh, the right to revolt, he thought that this was a way like a pressure release valve for people to vent their frustrations and, and to kind of revolt in a way without actually having a violent revolution, that elections and, and the ballot helps us do that. Okay, after we decided to declare independence, we had to set up a new government. Uh, the first order of business was defending the nation, or actually to conduct the revolution. Um, and to do this, the colonists had to think about how they wanted to set this up. And they had a few different requirements. First, they wanted a government that had enough power to do its job. However, they didn't want to grant 
any groups or individuals too much power. Why do you think they wanted to, to set this up this way? Right. Well, we had just overthrown the British, uh, a tyrannical, oppressive government. Uh, naturally, you're going to want to set up something that's a complete opposite. So. Yeah, so they, they sided on a weaker government, um, but one that could still do its job regarding uh, the Revolutionary War. And they also wanted to protect state power, okay? So they wanted to keep the power of the states, they wanted to keep that individuality and that sovereignty, uh, and especially protecting individual rights and liberties. They just had the intolerable acts, as they, right. they called them. They wanted to keep government out of citizens' lives, keep those protections there when they needed it, but a less intrusive government. The first national government that we had is called the Articles of Confederation. Uh, first written in 1777 and really lasts us through the 1780s up until we write the Constitution in 1787. So um, why don't we take a look at what was within this firm league of friendship, as it was called, uh, between the 13 states. Okay, so speaking of this firm league of friendship, what the heck does that mean? <laughs> uh, well, in general, confederation is different than what we see as our federal government now. Uh, it's a it's a group of individual entities together for a purpose. The purpose then was to set up a first government and to defend themselves against uh, England or to revolt against England. But in the system, all independent states still have their sovereignty. Uh, all that sovereignty isn't collected into one national government. Correct. So what would be a modern example of that? example of a modern confederation would be something like the European Union. Now, uh, really coming together uh, largely for purposes uh, of economic policy, um, but also uh, some, some defense purposes as well. So even though these are separate countries, they are coming together for a common purpose, either uh, to share a common currency, maybe some trade purposes, and, and also defense. Okay, and like the Articles of Confederation, the European Union is having some issues as well, trying Correct. to manage who has the power and who does what and, and what role each individual nation has for the greater good of all of them. Correct. Okay, so some basics of the Articles of Confederation. First, they had a Congress of the Confederation that had representatives from each state, uh, but that was the only branch. There was no executive branch, there was no judicial branch, so there was no modern presidency or court system that we would know of today. It was just a Congress. And in that Congress, each state had one vote, which we'll get to in a second. That was a little problematic because some states were much bigger and more influential than other states. However, each one got the same number of votes in that Congress. Every state retained their power and independence in almost all matters. Congress could create a military to defend against foreign invasion. I mean, you know, we got to think the number one priority at this time uh, had uh, just fought a war with the British. Um, when we're in the 1780s, you know, it's a very real likelihood that uh, another foreign attack could happen. And so in that sense, uh, trying to have some sort of protection uh, was, was definitely important to defend against a foreign invasion. Okay, there are some major drawbacks of this. The first is that Congress had no power to enforce its laws. So they could write anything they wanted, but with no executive branch, they were really at the whim of the states just to voluntarily go along with these laws. We kind of know throughout history, whenever you have a system like that, people aren't going to do it. Um, or at least when it comes to the pocketbook, they're not going to because they couldn't tax. Right, so how are they going to raise a military if they couldn't raise any taxes to fund it? So how would they even try to get the money in the articles? Well, as it said, it was up to the states to collect revenue. And I think we saw from our class simulation that any time a vote came up or a resolution to tax uh, either imports or exports, uh, because the states could voluntarily decide whether they wanted to pay taxes or not, and most of the time those, those resolutions failed mm -hmm. uh, because states weren't willing to tax their own citizens. And so this was problematic. But another problem that compounded everything is they couldn't be changed you couldn't change the Articles of Confederation themselves to fix this tax issue uh, unless every state agreed to it. So to get all 13 states to agree on anything at that time, because they were so vastly different as communities and, and uh, as, as states, their characteristics, it, nothing could get done. Well, how were some of these problems within the Articles of Confederation solved in a new national government when we take a look at state representation? Okay, so... The first plan to try to fix this idea of representation was the Virginia plan. And what Virginia said is we're going to create two chambers and that each chamber is going to have votes based on population. So the bigger states would have more representation in Congress uh, and more power. And they thought that this was fair because if more people live in the bigger states, that that state should have more power in the new Congress. The problem is to get this new constitution passed, you're going to need the support of the smaller states. 
Smaller states had their own plan, the New Jersey plan. Uh, the idea, kind of similar to the Articles of Confederation, where each state would get one vote. You know, that way Rhode Island, Delaware, New Jersey has the same voting power as some of the powerhouses like New York, Pennsylvania, and Virginia. Um, this idea of equality uh, we still see in something like the New Jersey plan. So they decided to come up with a great compromise, or what I think it was called the Connecticut Compromise as yes. well, right? It was Sherman. Correct. So Roger Sherman Correct. came up with this compromise and said, all right, let's split up Congress into two different houses. One of them is going to be the Senate, which is like the New Jersey plan, uh, where you have two representatives per state. It's based on equality. Small states like that still do. Uh, House of Representatives that were based on the population so that the bigger states would have more. So, for instance, Rhode Island only has two representatives in the House today. California has something like 35. Okay, so that was definitely favoring the larger states. And then they split up the powers between the two. Not perfect for every situation, but it did settle that, that contentious issue at the time, at least, on how representation was going to be uh, uh, conducted. Additionally, if you think about the articles, one branch, a Congress, no president and no judicial branch. Well, how was this resolved in the new national government under the U.S. Constitution? This idea of separation of powers, you divide the power of government into three different branches. This goes back to our first unit on how to prevent the abuse of power, uh, but also to make government a little bit more efficient, have an executive branch that can carry out and enforce those laws. You have a judicial branch to help interpret laws or um, to settle disputes, and then, of course, your legislative branch, which ha has existed in those state governments at the time in the Articles, uh, to make laws and vote on matters of public importance. Okay, so that's just a small glimpse of, of two different ways that the Constitution settled these problems with the Articles of Confederation. I will take a closer look at that in the next unit when we talk about the Constitution in more depth.